Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie have been engaged in a legal battle over Chateau Miraval, the winery estate they purchased in 2008. Brad says that Angelina sold her shares of the winery without his consent, and the new owner has been trying to initiate a hostile takeover of Chateau Miraval. Now, Angelina's team had subpoenaed documents from Brad Pitt, his business manager, and Brad's company, Mondo Bongo. Brad had been fighting to not let Angelina's team gain control of those documents, but a judge in LA ruled on Friday that Brad Pitt and his team has to hand over the documents and can't hold off until they appeal the decision. Now, while this is a win for Angelina, it's just a small battle in a really huge war. Our favorite attorney here at the Talk of Shame, Kate Watson Moss, who helped us break down the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, weighs in on this Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie saga. Another episode of Kiki's Court with Kate Watson Moss. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Okay, so this is a case that we have been talking about for a long time and we haven't been able to get into it. Um, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, you know, they owned this winery, Miraval. I've had it. Very delicious. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Which they purchased in 2008, I believe. They purchased it as it was going to be like their home. And they also wanted to build this vineyard. Um, Flash forward to where we are today. They have filed for divorce. They still haven't finalized the divorce. And I think this Miraval estate is a big part of that. Um, And Brad Pitt has now sued Angelina Jolie because essentially Angelina sold her shares in this estate to some Russian oligarch that essentially now owns, I guess, half of the vineyard, basically. And um, it's basically destroyed Miravelle's operations, what Brad alleges. And he also said that, you know, Angelina did this behind his back. It, you know, he was supposed to uh, get first right of, of refusal if, you know, these shares were ever to be sold. Um, and so he's fighting to, uh, I guess, keep his vineyard alive. We both looked through the complaint. Obviously, I've looked through it with my layman eye. You looked through it with your very legal uh, analysis eye. Um, and I'm wondering if we're coming to the same conclusions about what's going on, because I think a lot of people... One, they just don't even know what this case is about. They just think it's like two squabbling rich people fighting over a vineyard, which, you know, it is. It's very warm and roses. (laughs) Um, But when you get into it, it's actually pretty some interesting stuff that even involves like the Ukraine war and how, you know, this third party being introduced as a new partner is really damaging the reputation of Miraval. Yeah. And it's interesting because when this so this, uh, the complaint that we read is an amended complaint, which means it's a new version. The first version was filed back in February of 2022, and that was just against Angelina Jolie and her uh, shell corporation, Nouvelle. Um, and so it's only in June that they brought in all of these third parties, the Stoli brand, um, this Russian oligarch and his associates. Um, and it's very complicated because legally when you're bringing in foreign citizens and foreign entities, um, the question is whether or not the California court will have jurisdiction over them. Um, now this, the brand um, SPI Group Holding Limited, which is associated with Stoli Vodka, um, they've already been brought into court in California before because they have employees there. That is maybe less of an issue. But I know from experience that if you want to try and drag someone from another country into court, it's really hard <laughs> and really expensive, <laughs> especially if they live somewhere that isn't part to part of a extra extradition treaty that we Well we- yeah. I can't imagine Russia wants to play nice with us, especially with someone that's, you know, very rich and very well connected, even though when we'll get into it, it seems like this guy maybe is losing favor with some of the his rich friends. Um, yeah, but essentially uh, yeah. You know, Brad and Angelina, you know, they're in lovey-dovey land. They want to buy this estate. And Brad has his LLC, which is Mondo Bongo. Um, And I think he purchases uh, into Miraval. Because Miraval was this existing vineyard, but it was just the small, unprofitable little sort of vineyard. You know, he purchases it and they're like, we're going to turn this into this flourishing vineyard. I think he, his LLC purchases 60% of the shares and then... Angelina sets up Nouvelle, which is essentially only going to hold shares for Miraval, and it owns 40% of the shares. And what it sounds like is 
Brad thought he was at acquiring a vineyard that was already sort of profitable. Once he learned it wasn't, and they were going to have to put more and more money into it, he continued to shell out money for renovations. And at some point, Angelina stopped and she wanted to focus on the Jolie Pitt Foundation. But it was fine because it seemed like there was this unspoken agreement, which is a lot of this problem is like, because they were married, I think there were a lot of these unspoken agreements that never made it to paper, but that this was Brad's passion project and it was fine. And because it was such a passion project and they were so in love, at some point he even agreed, I will share, I will sell you for one euro, essentially 50% of the holdings. So Novell was holding 50% of the holdings and Mondo Bondo was holding 50% of the holdings. Is my understanding correct? Right. So the way it's alleged in the complaint, he started out with 60%. She started out with 40%, which they owned through two layers of protection. So they each had their own California LLCs, which is why there's jurisdiction here. When you have a, a, a form like a formed entity in California, you're going to be subject to that court's jurisdiction. They then purchased this shell corporation called Quimicum, which that owns the, the, both the home and the vineyard. So Brad's pouring work into it. He's doing a lot of like the manual labor and organizing all of, you know, the renovations and getting things. He's starting to understand how the soil works in the wine. He talks about that a bit. Um, And then that goes up into 2012 when they get engaged, at which point um, things start to, seems like they're starting to shift with Mirabal a bit. So shortly thereafter in 2013, in early 2013, he starts this joint venture with this famous uh, winemaker from France the Perrine family and they start sort of a new group um, and they start really like focusing on making high quality wine and they have a great year. And then shortly after that, um, that's when Brad sells 10% of his holdings to Angelina. So they're at 50, 50. Now the thing that's interesting is under the law of contracts, any contract has to be supported by what's called consideration. So that's the idea that if I give you something by a contract, it's only valid if you give me something back. So it can be something that doesn't even like mean anything. So here it's one euro, it's kind of just like symbolic, but if that's not met, it's not, it's not a legit contract. So he's here out alleging that that one euro was never paid, which means, hey, maybe that contract isn't actually valid, but that's <laughs> under the laws of France. So they're fighting that out over there. Um, yeah. That's like, we're assuming he like assumes arguendo here that it actually was a valid transfer. But he's arguing that the only reason he did that is because there was an understanding. There's two understandings. One, she wouldn't sell without first giving him, she wouldn't sell at all, First, firstly. She would like keep it within, within the family, so to yeah. say. And see that if she was going to sell, she would give him what's called a right of first refusal, which means she says, hey, I'm going to go sell this, but I'm giving you the option to buy it at the price that I'm getting from the external market first. So you have an option to buy it before I give it to anyone else. And he's saying that was unwritten, which is an interesting choice. I would really think that if that was the intention, they would put it in writing, seeing as everything else was in writing. But that's sort of like the underlying facts there. And so after they split it 50-50, in the next year, they get married. Um, And unfortunately, the marriage only lasted about two years. So. I know, like the courtship, <laughs> the dating, all of that lasted much longer, which is why I, personally, I subscribe to the Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell method. It's like, just be in love and be together because it seems like the marriage sometimes just ruins it all. Um, I, you know, I will say, even though we haven't gotten to trial yet, I, I do believe the $1 was never transferred because what rich people are really spending their time transferring a dollar, you know? Well, I will say... It's not on the rich person. It's on the rich person's lawyer to say, hey, I want you to write that check and I want you to sign it and I want you to send me a copy of it because it's your job to make sure that their contracts are valid. That's what they're paying you lots of money to do. Transfer the money. Send it. Send a check. I mean, it's not that hard. Even if you never cash it, if you sent it, you, you paid. I guess I was also surprised to learn that, you know, they were able to like essentially purchase this vineyard with an LLC set up in California. Like, is that normal? Like, I would think that usually you'd have to set up something overseas and purchase it through that. No, no. I mean, it's very, it's very normal. Okay. (laughs) Um, And it's uh, almost expected at this point because through the LLC, you really provide yourself a lot of protection. Um, You don't, risk your asset. So if something happens, 
you know, your assets are protected. So you can kind of like, I mean, Donald Trump is the king of doing this. He has lots of LLCs, the LLC or the corporation goes bankrupt and so oh, that's, that's, that's the entity. You can't come after me. It's not my money. Um, you'd have to, it's called piercing the corporate veil. You'd have to sort of break down those barriers. There's a whole legal format for doing that. But yes, yeah, it, it, it's very, very normal. Not only that, there's sort of like three layers here. If you look at the org chart of it, there's their LLCs, which go into this, holding company, the Quimicum entity, then you've got Mira, Chateau Miraval SA, which covers both the home and the winery. And then above that, you've got Miraval Provence, which is the joint venture between the Miraval home and vineyard and this famous French wine family. And that's where you get where the actual wine is made. And I think that's also like kind of interesting here because what they have, what Brad and Angelina have is 50% each in this holding company. I think what they were all contemplating was if they're going to try and get rid of Angelina's shares when she at some point said, I no longer feel comfortable holding ownership in an alcohol company, which is what she said, which is an interesting yeah. thing to say. They, they thought that she would just sort of sell her ownership in this and the shell company so that someone else can have it or, or Brad could have a hundred percent. Instead, she just sold this, this useless LLC that she created to sort of, own it, which I don't think anyone contemplated. They thought, oh, she'll just have that forever. But yeah. that's something they definitely should have expected because she was in her within her rights to sell it. Well, that's what's so interesting because obviously, you know, both of them have very expensive lawyers. I mean, you even discovered that Brad Pitt has the same attorneys that Twitter does, which I mean, I knew Brad Pitt was rich, but I don't know. Something about sharing the same attorneys as Twitter is like rich, rich, right? <laughs> yeah. So they have, you know, these very expensive attorneys and obviously, Angelina, one found a loophole and said, look, you won't really be going against what you agreed to if you sell, you know, the shares in this Nouvelle because it's not selling necessarily the vineyard. And so it's like she does have a case there. But the fact that that LLC only was set up for the sole purpose, it does seem sort of backhanded. Well, there's also, I think part of the reason why they filed in California as well is different states have different rules about what you can bring in as evidence when you're fighting over a contract. So in, in a lot of states, most states really, all you can do is called looking at the four corners of the documents. All you can look at, the, at is the contract itself. In California, they have something called the, uh, the peril evidence rule where you can look outside of the contracts. And so like the oral negotiations between the parties, um, what the expectations were. You can bring that in where normally that would be inadmissible. So I think that's probably what they're also looking to do here is to say, hey, Brad this whole time expected that he would be, this was like his baby. They understood this. It was his. She had her own thing. The expectation was not that she could just get rid of it and, and you know, give it to anyone. Now, when it comes to the timeline, you know, we get to essentially 2016 is when they file divorce, but we also know just through the gossip, you know, brags that that was around the same time when there was that supposed incident where allegedly, you know, Brad maybe hit one of the kids. And then I think this eventually led to like a restraining order situation, you know, between them. Now, I, what I remember from some of the paperwork was when Angelina, so essentially Angelina, I guess, I don't know how she meets an oligarch. And that's another part of this that's really interesting because, you know, we know Angelina as this human rights, right? Like part of her foundation is like fighting for human rights and all of these things. I, I think that always has to conflict when you're rich because look, billionaires, most of them, I'm sorry, are evil. Like you can't, you can't get that rich without doing horrible things. And so for her to even be connected to this oligarch seems weird. Now I know the oligarch had supposedly reached out in the past, right? I think he saw Angelina and Brad, you know, he owned Stoli Vodka or the controlling shares of Stoli Vodka and he wanted a part of Hollywood and this rosé. And Brad was like, looked into this dude and he was like, absolutely not. I want nothing to do with him. Do you think that Angelina purposely reached out because she knew that Aunt, that Brad did not like this guy or just the fact that there's only so many billionaires who can buy vineyards and it was just the quickest option. Well, if I had to guess, I would guess that this Russian oligarch reached out to Angelina's people directly um, and said, hey, you know, I'm really interested in Miraval. Brad uh, was not open to my I, my ideas and did not was not interested in me joining. Um, how, what's your ownership? Are you involved in this? Like, I'm sure he figured out that she has some involvement and probably, I'm not sure about what the, uh, 
the information access to the sort of the, the European documents on ownership were, but perhaps they're public. He could have figured it out. Um, but he's a rich guy. I'm sure he could figure out whatever he wants. And uh, just approached her and said, hey, I can, I can make this happen for you. And it sounds like she was not receptive to it until Brad won that first custody battle. Um, and then she, like, I think the next week was like, you know what, negotiations are off. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out something else here. And that's when sort of the process with this, this uh, former Russian, ol I mean, it's, it's a little confusing to me whether he's an action, actual Russian <laughs> oligarch or he's like a British and Israeli citizen now, and he hasn't been back to Russia since 2000. And it's a little confusing to me, but um, yeah, she, that's who she ended up selling to. And the guy's name is Yuri Scheffler. We're going to, you know, we'll talk more about him, but that is who the oligarch, maybe not oligarch is. Um, no, but you're right. I mean, that would make sense that, you know, he reached out to her, but that's also the, uh, the, the messiest part of this case is that there can only be so many coincidences, right? And like, okay, so we were working towards an agreement. We know it seemed like they had even come up with a number where Brad was going to purchase it for the set amount. And I think, she, you know, she's saying, no, he, he didn't pay that, but like they had come to this agreement, but then in their personal side, you know, he wins this case and then all of a sudden all bets are off. I don't agree to the settlement. I, you know, I just want out. You're right. And it's like a judge any smart judge will be able to look and just say like, there's only so many coincidences that can happen versus like you just being retaliatory. Right. But at the same time, there's this idea that property is only as good as your ability to get rid of it. Right. So here there's, I think a very, I think she probably at the whole time she was going through this and was getting counsel from her lawyers was probably, probably sort of thinking, I ha there's no written document that says I can't get rid of this. There's no written document that says I can't sell this to someone else. And if I don't want to sell it to him, I don't want to sell it to him. And, you know, there's a reason why in this complaint, there's no breach of contract claim. That's because there's no contract. There's an implied, in fact, contract and, a, and in the alternative, a quasi contract. And I typically am a little skeptical when I see those, especially when there's so many other contracts around in this case. The idea is that like, if you actually meant, if you intended for that to be what you were bound by, that should have been in the contract. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's sort of a little bit of a buyer's remorse on Brad's part. He should have maybe negotiated for that contract if that's what the expectation was. It's so true because you're right. I mean, like there's all these other contracts, but yet like the the main things that you're fighting for don't exist. I mean, come on, you do have Twitter lawyers. Like, come yeah. on, you got to be better yeah. than that. Yeah. So, you know, one of the most interesting parts, again, it's like because, you know, now Angelina is dealing with this Yuri Scheffler guy and part of the claim is also about how this Yuri dude essentially comes in and tries to do a hostile takeover of this winery. And Brad says they essentially have to stop their day-to-day -day operations in order to keep fighting off this dude. Like he's like, I think he's trying to take money out of bank accounts, like all these things. And so they have to use all of their resources to stop him and they can't focus on running the winery. So that was like one of their other claims on top of the fact that you know, then we get to now Russia has invaded Ukraine and now in the Ukraine, Stoli is representative of Russia and Yuri is the controlling owner of Stoli Vodka. So there's these boycotts and people are all against it. And they're saying his association now with the brand is also tarnishing us. Like this is, we, we've gone from award-winning wine winery to now being associated with this dude and we want no parts of it you know how valid do you think those parts i mean they, they seem like the most salacious and interesting but how valid do you think they are well it is really interesting because i remember in the weeks after the war in ukraine started there was this great push in the media of covering russian oligarchs who had connections with american businesses or american business people and there was a lot of pressure on american businesses that they were not going to be doing work with anyone associated with Russia, there was this big outpouring of support for Ukraine. That is legitimate. And I did do a little Googling and there have been some uh, protests against Stoli, which is also really interesting because Stoli is manufactured in Latvia. And in fact, there's some, one of the reasons why um, he sort of was no longer in good graces in Russia is because he bought the Stoli brand, the Stoliknikinya, 
I'm, Stolik Naya, yeah. Stolik Naya. <laughs> uh, he bought that brand and then a court in Russia said, no, no, that's not legitimate. That's like a cultural heritage. You can't have that brand, brand. but he started using it anyway and making Stoli vodka in La- Latvia. So he, the question of like whether it's even like a Russian brand at this point, but I think like the cultural ramifications around it are certainly sound. So it's definitely possible that like being associated with that brand could tarnish their reputation. But the allegations related to sort of misconduct in in running the business and trying to interfere with suppliers and trying to talk to distributors and also trying to get access to Mirabelle's proprietary information is a really big deal. Um, and it's a really big problem when you think about the business as a separate entity, Mirabal Provence, they probably have lots of NDAs and information that protects their trade secrets. And because they didn't have any involvement in the purchase process by this guy, he's not bound by any of it. So mm-hmm. he's not competing wine brands that even if this deal doesn't go through, getting access to all of that information could be very harmful for Mirabal. And I would be very nervous about that as well. Um, and that you know, outside of any other kind of legal obligations here could could make this very messy um, because the Mirabel Provence entity is, is separate from all these other entities. So trying to protect that is is real. Yeah. And honestly, like, I mean, maybe I watch too many movies, but I would firmly believe that a billionaire would purchase this solely for that information so they could take it back, utilize it and destroy the competitor. Like, that's just what rich people do, because when you have that much money and time on your hands and he probably still is bitter about Brad turning him down the first time. So yeah, he he'll just... go, right. He'll go by Whispering Angel and start destroying him or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Now Brad is sort of left with the, you know, task of making this guy essentially stop, which how do you enforce U.S. law or even any law on a place like Russia? Like in my mind, Russia is just like Wild West in that respect where they're like, we don't listen to anybody, even like people with like, we don't listen to anybody. We do what we want to do. So how do you get them to stop trying to interfere with your business? And then how do you then try to get them to court? It just seems impossible. Well, first of all, note, I don't actually think that there's any Russian individuals or entities involved. Okay. Russia does present a very unique problem. I mean, if you look at sort of like the Brittany Griner drama right now, like there's no, there's nothing you can do when there's a, com- there's a country that's hostile like that. They're not cooperating. They're not going to cooperate. It's just sort of like a, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation. Here, the, So Yuri Scheffler is of British and Israeli descent. Alexei Olnik, I don't know. I think he's either Ukrainian or might be from somewhere else, but he's also outside of the U.S. Got it. And there's SPI Group Holding Limited, which is a company incorporated in Cyprus, which is actually very Mm -hmm. common um, for investment vehicles because of tax reasons. And then Tanut Del Mondo is sort of the Stoli subsidiary that handles all of their wine business. And that's a company based in Netherlands. And also complicating this is that uh, some of the claims for violation of various laws are a violation of Luxembourg law. So you would have the strange situation of a California court interpreting and applying the law of Luxembourg, which is very odd. Um, yeah. Not an area where I would think California courts have very much expertise, but you know, they've got very good. Well, are you even trained in that in law school? Like, do you learn those things? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I will and I will say, like, I don't even know how you would research a lot of that law because a lot of it would be in a different language. So that's <laughs> another wrinkle. But putting that aside, I, I do guess think you we, hire they're, they're rich enough to hire consultants to come in and I don't know, interpret it for you. I don't know. Right, right. Well, and I think it's important to note, like, especially for the individuals in the case a big part of establishing jurisdiction under state courts is being able to physically serve them. Um, And a lot of times you're restricted to physically serving them within the district where the the case is pending. So if they just don't come there, they won't get served. (laughs) And they've also got to be under the personal jurisdiction of the court, which means that their activities related to the claims in the case have to be based there. There there could be general jurisdiction, which I think there would be over SBI Group Holding Limited, which has already been hailed into court, I think, on employment matters. If, you empl- if you're a company that employs people in the district, then you're typically 
found to have uh, a presence there. Um, mm -hmm. so that presents another problem. And at this point, um, I haven't seen like either a motion to dismiss or an answer filed, which is what you would see if there is jurisdiction. If you, you know, file an answer to a to a complaint like this, then you kind of you, it's called consent jurisdiction. You consent to the jurisdiction. You wouldn't file that unless you either like decided you wanted to take the fight there or you think there's going to be jurisdiction over you anyway. So I, I would be very surprised if they didn't fight the jurisdictional aspect of this. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine too. Do you think that Brad is like, in his mind, would love to see like a televised like trial for this? Because like, does he, do you think he, after like the Johnny and Amber case, that if the public could just see what's going on, that he would have the support? And even let's say he couldn't get any of these people in court, it would just raise Miraval's reputation to the point where it would just help his brand overall? I think that's definitely a possibility. I think also just putting this kind of public pressure on her and her team is probably going to help him in trying to just resolve this issue and get a settlement. Um, I think that's probably what they're looking for here is figuring out how much do we have to pay you to just make this all go away. Um, and I think this is probably one way that he's trying to extract some pressure. Um, yeah. I know that, that's my fear is that I do think they will settle and we won't actually get to ever see a trial as much as as much as I would love to watch this go down. I think ultimately Angelina's just going to be like, well, this is my number now, you know, and maybe it's a number that he wouldn't agree to. And maybe now he's more willing to. Yeah. And I will also say in, in my experience, breach of contract cases are they don't typically go to trial that often. Like a defamation case is super interesting because there's usually a lot of facts. And facts are great for trial because courts, judges cannot determine facts. That's the jury's job. You don't want to invade the jury's purview. In breach of contract cases, it's usually just evaluating very pure legal issues. Is there a contract here? Is there not? And those typically don't see trial. Um, although here, because there's actually, there isn't a, there isn't a contract. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, breach of no contract. Exactly. Right, breach of no contract. So <laughs> that might be sort of like a different way. And there are some tort claims too. There's um, intentional interference with business relationships and um, breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, those types of things, which are a little bit more fact specific. Um, but I would be shocked if this doesn't settle um, really. Well, I would be shocked too. The only reason, and again, this is me being in my Hollywood brain, that it I would think it wouldn't is because, you know, again, we watched the Johnny and Amber trial, which was a defamation claim. But to this day, I think a lot of people still think it was a case about domestic violence. Yeah. Obviously, we've seen claims from Angelina about against Brad, you know, and you know, I wonder if she might even say, you know, screw it. I do want to go to trial and use it as an opportunity to tell some things that like I couldn't get out otherwise, you know, like even if it's a breach of contract case, it's like, well, the reason that happened is because on this plane, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, I would think that the judge, especially judges listening, like hearing these very big sort of high profile cases are very careful about what they allow in and what is relevant, what is not relevant. Um, the Johnny and Amber case was a little different in that sort of like at the core of the case were these these very serious allegations. Um, here, I think it would be harder to bring that in, although creative lawyers can do anything. We put our mind to it, we can get it done, but um, it, it might be a little bit less salacious than you would hope. Although the allegations related to sort of like the changing on a dime after the custody hearing and, um, you know, some of the backstabbing related to talks with these uh, foreign actors, I think could make it very interesting. No, and I think that's what's so cool about like these celebrity cases is that, you know, as much as we've had more access to celebrity than ever, right? We see them all the time. We actually don't know a lot about what happens in this world. But when it comes to lawsuits, there's not a lot you can hide because there's just so much that goes into these complaints of like, whoa, you got married where and you were doing what and who had, you know, and how much money was going in and out. Um, and so it's become like our new soap opera almost because you're never going to see that sort of thing on a reality show. Not only that, in America, there's this idea that our, our systems of justice, our courts have to remain open and transparent as compared to Russia, for example, 
where a whole trial could happen and you could see nothing or hear nothing and everything happens in darkness and there's no sort of checks and balances on it. Here, the only way, so for example, you go through discovery, you're exchanging documents, you're being deposed, that's all public by default. And you have to fight very hard to keep things protected. Typically only things that are like a trade secret or could like expose someone to danger are, are protected and kept away from the public. So I think any time now that celebrities are engaging in any of these lawsuits, they have to be very careful about uh, what they're doing because it opens them up to discovery. And I think that's also a big reason why they use shell corporations like this, because those shell corporations can fight it out without necessarily dragging the owner in who might be, you know, three to four layers protected. Um, whereas here, because again, there's no contract, they have to bring, they have to be brought in under Pitt and Jolie themselves personally, because they themselves personally are part of the dispute as opposed to just their corporate entities. I think I saw something, maybe I'm mistaken. I felt like I saw something like an April 23rd trial date, maybe if this were to go to trial again, and that's in 2023. So it's like, it's a long ways out. And I do think that we'll probably see a settlement before then. Um, So, you know, obviously if there's any new insights, but I think this was like a good just understanding of like what they're even fighting for. Um, And we'll see what happens. And there's so many other cases to still talk about. I mean, we just got word today that Amber has officially filed for her appeal. So I don't really know how far that will go. I mean, I know we've talked about this. I I mean, do you even think this appeal has legs? Well, it's hard to say because all that she filed today was her notice of appeal, which basically says, I'm going to appeal this. It doesn't say what grounds she will be appealing on. And that's basically like a placeholder. Um, You kind of, everyone kind of, who even has like a vague intention to appeal files that. Um, And then you can always decide to withdraw it before you file your actual appeal. When she files her actual appeal, that's when we'll see like the bases on which she's she's trying to appeal. I think they'll probably be aligned with what she put in her motion for reconsideration. Um, But uh, I think that she will probably have a tough time um, for the reasons we talked about in our last video. Um, I think that a lot of what she's quibbling with are jury findings. And it's very, very hard to overturn a jury finding. It's a little bit easier to overturn um, a not sort of a a finding or an order by the judge that is um, not, the standard is called abuse of discretion. Basically, the lower court has a lot of discretion in making legal determinations, um, which is generally the standard on appeal. So that too is pretty hard to overturn. Um, I don't see a lot of like pure legal issues that are sort of ripe for a change in the law. So I think it will be an uphill battle, Um, but she, is an American citizen and has the right to appeal like all of us. And, um, you know, someone's got to give Elaine all that work. She's going to be busy. Now, if I remember correctly, she was supposed to have to pay the judgment in order to be able to appeal. Then we talked about like, it could just be a bond that she put up. Yeah. Do we know if that happened? I know recently that there was a hearing in which Elaine made a comment about the fact that she was going to be appealing and the judge basically reprimanded her and says, well, you can't appeal unless you post that bond. Um, yeah. And at that point, she hadn't. Um, she will have to uh, in order to proceed with her appeal. Um, now, there's different, there's fina- like financial firms that will help you with that. Um, yeah. And I've also seen reports that she was, you know, on a private jet. So I'm sure she's got some money to put at least part of it down, put a down payment. Um, but we'll see. But don't financial firms want to know that you have some sort of like uh, collateral that you like, you know, even if you're saying, okay, I can put up the 10%, like they, we all know she doesn't have the other part of it. So why would they put that up for her? I think a lot of it is going to be contingent on what she can exchange as collateral. So typically when you think of collateral um, for like loans and that kind of thing, you think of like someone's house, someone's car, things that someone can actually like go and repossess. A lot of times what people will pledge are um, like intellectual property rights. So for example, if she were to say, I'm going to write a book down the line and if you, you know, give me a loan as collateral, I'll give you either part of these intellectual property rights or a, you know, a portion of proceeds from it. I'll give you, you know, a portion of proceeds from any movie I do down the line and whatever. So she can, she can assign those rights. Those certainly have value for her. Um, 
there's a lot of very complicated and interesting financial uh, arrangements out there. And I'm, I, with someone with her resources, I'm sure she could figure it out. But at the same time, she's also got this uh, insurance issue going on out there. So that's also got to be looming pretty large um, because if they find that what she did was um, done intentionally, then it will be outside the bounds of her policy. And there's a big question of whether she'll have to pay back all of her legal fees, which her insurance company has covered thus far. That I would think that that would be the scariest lawsuit she's facing right now because you you've paid your premium. You're under the assumption that, oh, they're going to cover it. If anything, I think the reason I would be appealing would be for the simple fact of like, I just want that malice part removed. Like, find me guilty, but take off the malice so my insurance can at least cover it. I mean, right? Right, right. I guess there is a question then of whether or not um, a settlement of that kind of finding would sort of trump the jury finding. Um, I think the insurance company might take issue with that because ultimately insurance companies are beholden only to their shareholders and their management. So they want they want their money if they can get it. Um, yeah. And so I, yeah, that would make me, if I was in her shoes, very nervous. Yeah. We did have another question come in to the DM. Someone asked, please ask Kate how wise this is, meaning the appeal. So many people followed the trial. With more people finding Johnny Depp likable, isn't that likely to taint the jury pool even more than previously? Well, there's one incorrect assumption in there. It would be very, I guess the assumption in there is that the appellate court would, for whatever reason, find that there was some merit to her appeal and then remand the case back to the lower court for a new trial. I think that's what would happen. That, I think, first, that a lot of things have to happen for that to happen. They would have to first find that there was some ground for appeal and then kick it back down to the lower court. And then it would have to not settle. At that point, once it gets kicked down, I would assume the, again, the motivation to settle would be pretty high there. Um, I do think that is a good point, though. And I'm sure Amber's lawyer would argue that, that any jury pool um, now after all this time has passed, would it would be highly prejudicial and be hard to find people uh, that would not have some kind of bias or some preconceived notions about the parties and the, the issues. Um, Typically, it's hard to get a case sort of dragged away. Um, I'm not sure where else in the United States they could have one, uh, have a trial with that argument. Usually, you know, you would kick it to another state where there's less, you know, knowledge. This is global, yeah. Well, there's literally nowhere they can go um, yeah. where no one will know about it. So that would create some further issues. And they would just probably have to spend a lot more time and money vetting their jury and making sure that the jury, I don't know, what's somewhere without internet for a while and didn't talk about it at all. But um, I think that's something they'd have to contend with. Um, and they would, maybe she would ask for a bench trial, but again, because there's a right to a jury trial, um, I think that would be very hard to, to win. Honestly, it's times like this. Um, I don't know if you've seen the trailer for that new Jordan Peele movie, Nope. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly what it's about, but I know it's about aliens, right? And it's like, whenever uh -huh. I see stuff like that, it's times like that where I'm like, I just wish it would happen to us only for the sole purpose of like, if we were just being attacked by aliens, maybe we would just all come together and like as one. But then I watch movies like Don't Look Up and I'm like, exactly. no, that's what I was just we thinking. actually <laughs> wouldn't. There'd be half the people that would just say, it's not happening. And exactly. We would just all die together. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think that's right. I think there's just it's just very divide, divisive culture right now, and social media amplifies that. People seem to think that when they say something online, no one can hear it or it doesn't sting as, as bad. But um, I think I think that's why the law of reputational harm is really important right now because people are just saying more and more and more things, um, and there's this culture of incivility that I think is going to be breeding ground for for uh, defamation law and, and, and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, and you put in a really good point on your stories. And if you're not following Kate, follow at Kate Watson Moss on Instagram um, about, you know, there was this whole case with Roe v. Wade and there was a 10 year old who was raped and needed an abortion. And uh, it was the attorney general was essentially, you know, making it seem like the doctor didn't file the correct paperwork. And um, you were just pointing out like, 
using your language as like, you know, for politics, like you're trying to like pick sides and using politics, but like harming people, mm, that's not what the first amendment is about. Like we can't get into the space of like, you know, oh, it's my right, but I'm also fighting for, you know, these, it doesn't work that way. You say it much more eloquently than I do, of course. Well, I think it's really, I think it is really interesting. So like, if you look at sort of like the last how long has Real Housewives been around? 15 years, 10, 15 years? I mean, maybe 20. Maybe 20 point. at this point. But sort of that whole culture of like verbal abuse at some time and saying things about other people has kind of been like, oh, this is an accepted part of our culture and it bleeds out everywhere else. And in some instances, no harm, no foul. You, you, people get over it. But when you're talking about, especially private citizens, people like doctors who aren't public figures, who aren't in the public eye, who don't have a platform where they can respond to false statements, then the question really is, is that the kind of speech that we want to protect, especially when it's only motivated by politics and sort of like trying to stir the pot and get people very upset. And I think right now there has been a very strong reaction to that kind of language and that kind of attack. So for example, looking at this um, the, in, the Indiana AG, the potential suit by this doctor. And also looking at, for example, the lawsuits that the families of the victims of Sandy Hook have filed against Alex Jones, who made false statements claiming that these parents were crisis actors and the children weren't actually killed. They're, he's being sued and is being clobbered because he won't even show up to defend himself in these libel actions. And I think that's one way that sort of the public can hold people accountable for, for saying things that aren't true for their own gain. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's just going to keep going to keep happening. Yeah, because I always believe you can't unring that bell, right? Even if somebody who's were saying, I take the words back, half the people are still going to like live the rest of their life because they never get that information and just believe whatever it said. And so, and you know, it just should speak to speak volumes that the, the fact that people don't even want to show up to court to defend it, I'm sorry. Um, right. If, if you're really innocent, you know, you would show up. Right. And, that, and I think you're totally right with when you say you can't unring that bell. That is so true. Even if, you know, you put something up that's false and then it lives there for, you know, three minutes, you have a ton of followers. You understand this. Like it spreads so quickly. Even if you delete it, it's too late. It's out of your hands. It's gone. And I think that just means that people need to be more and more careful about what they're saying, both by making sure it's true or that there's, you know, some verifiable information behind it before they say it. And also, you know, when you're saying something that you don't know for certain, say that. If you're saying something that's your opinion, say that. Hey, it's my opinion that. I think that's just like common sense. Um, yeah. And people, I think, are going to have to be more aware of that as they, as they move forward. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, as always, I learned so much and uh, we will talk, meet again in Kiki's court. Perfect, thanks.